everything is made up of atoms everything we see in the in the body physical in the in the observable universe whatever we see it's made up of atoms atoms are made up of protons neutrons and electrons now protons neutrons and electrons are called subatomic particles protons have a positive electric charge neutrons have no charge and electrons have a negative electric charge we find that opposite charges attract each other and similar charges repel each other like we just discussed protons and neutrons bind together to form the nucleus of the atom and the electrons that surround and orbit the nucleus the neutrons act as a glue a nuclear glue to hold the positively charged protons tightly together in the nucleus so even though the protons are positively charged they repel each other still the neutrons they come combine inside the nucleus and act as a nuclear glue and that's how the nucleus is held together now hydrogen is the simplest atom it is basically its nucleus consists of only one proton and a single electron orbits this nucleus the helium atom has a nucleus made up of two protons and two neutrons and two electrons orbit the nucleus the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus determines the behavior and the properties of an atom so that is the basic thing now if you create a uh, an atom if you create a nucleus of 13 protons plus 14 neutrons and surround it with 13 electrons you get an aluminum atom and if you group millions of these aluminum atoms together you get the metallic substance called aluminum so aluminum has an atomic mass number of 27 which is the sum of the protons and the neutrons in the nucleus 14 neutrons plus 13 protons is 27 nucleons so that is the atomic mass number of aluminum similarly carbon has an atomic mass number of 12 oxygen has atomic no mass number of 16 calcium 40 and so on and so forth so hydrogen helium oxygen iron etc these are called elements the periodic table shows the atomic mass numbers and some other physical properties of the known elements now some atoms have extra neutrons for example some copper atoms have 34 neutrons and some copper atoms have 36 neutrons so atoms with the same number of protons but different number of neutrons are called isotopes hydrogen has three isotopes protium deuterium and tritium carbon has three isotopes carbon 12 carbon 13 and carbon 14 now certain elements have isotopes that are unstable in in some in some elements all the isotopes are unstable right so an atom of an unstable isotope is basically it is unstable it spontaneously decays into another element by a number of processes and this spontaneous decay of isotopes is what is called radioactive decay or radioactivity and the output of this decay is called radiation right so radioactive decay produces four different kinds of radiation four different kinds of radioactive rays so the alpha rays consist of alpha particles an alpha particle is basically made up of two pro two protons and two neutrons it is basically a helium nucleus uh beta rays are electrons and gamma rays which are extremely dangerous to human beings and living beings so gamma rays are very high energy photons very high energy so in spontaneous fission what happens is that an atom actually splits into two or more nuclei instead of throwing off an alpha particle or beta particle now atoms of heavy unstable elements such as uranium they undergo spontaneous fission uranium is naturally radioactive it constantly undergoes spontaneous fission at a very slow rate and other elements such as thorium and plutonium are also naturally radioactive right so when an atom undergoes fission it splits into two and it releases energy in the form of heat and in the form of gamma rays and the splitting of an atom releases a massive amount of heat and gamma radiation and it also releases neutrons 
So the two atoms that result from the fission also release beta radiation and gamma radiation of their own. And it's possible to artificially induce fission in uranium atoms by bombarding them with neutrons. So we find that half a kilo of uranium can give off energy equivalent to 5 million liters of petrol. 50 lakh liters of petrol is given off in from half a kilo of uranium. So the fission of uranium can be artificially induced and controlled in machines called nuclear reactors. The most commonly available isotope of uranium is called uranium-238. And the much rarer uranium-235 is suitable for nuclear power. Now, uranium has to be enriched so that it contains at least 3% uranium-235, which is good enough for nuclear power plants. But on the other hand, weapons-grade uranium is composed of at least 90% uranium 235. So it needs to be enriched to that level. So nuclear reactors take advantage of what's known as a nuclear chain reaction. You must have heard of this term, nuclear chain reaction. So in a nuclear chain reaction, the fission of one uranium atom causes the fission of more uranium atoms. The first step of a chain reaction is when a neutron hits a uranium-235 atom, splitting it and releasing two to three new neutrons. Now these two to three new neutrons hit other uranium-235 atoms. They also split and they release more neutrons. And these newly, newly released neutrons hit yet more uranium-235 atoms, splitting them. And the process continues. And this process un undergoes uh, continues until all the uranium atoms undergo fission. And this releases an enormous amount of heat. So this is the chain reaction. Now, in a chain reaction, the critical mass is the minimum mass of fissionable material required to sustain a fission chain reaction. And when you have a runaway, uncontrolled chain reaction, that is what results in an explosive release of an enormous amount of energy and radiation in the form of a nuclear explosion, right? So nuclear reactors control the heat emitted by the enriched uranium and they use it to heat water and generate steam. So what is done is that uranium is formed into two to three centimeter long pellets, which are arranged into rods and they are submerged in water. Now, if the chain reaction is not controlled, then the uranium will eventually overheat and melt. This is one of the most infamous photos from the Chernobyl reactor. This is the molten core of the reactor. So that's what happens. It will eventually overheat and melt if the chain reaction is not controlled. So how do we control it? So the heat is controlled by inserting cadmium rods into the reactor. These cadmium rods they absorb neutrons and thereby they slow down the nuclear fission reaction. So this uranium fuel acts as an extremely high energy heat source. It heats the water and turns this water into steam. This steam drives a turbine which spins a generator to produce power. Very simple. It's basically a steam engine, right? That's all it is. Now, if this reaction goes out of control, the uranium melts and the water and other fluids turn to steam and explode. This results in the explosive release of radioactive materials into the soil, into the water, atmosphere, etc. What you see here is the result of the Fukushima disaster. So this is what happened at Chernobyl in Fukushima and Three Mile Island. Now, apart from uranium, there is another element called thorium that can also be used in nuclear reactors. So India has a reasonably advanced thorium reactor program. Now there's another kind of reactor called a breeder reactor. It generates more fissile material than it consumes. Breeder reactors, they can breed plutonium from uranium-238 or they can breed uranium from thorium fuel. Now let's talk briefly about nuclear weapons or bombs. So nuclear fission bombs make use of the nuclear chain reaction. These nuclear weapons, they are either made up, they either use 
weapons grade uranium 235 which is at least 90% uranium 235 or they use plutonium fission weapons typically have two subcritical masses of uranium 235 or plutonium 239 and they have a neutron generator this neutron genera generator is typically a pellet of polonium or beryllium or maybe both the simplest way to detonate the nuclear weapon is to fire one subcritical mass into the other so a hemisphere of uranium 235 or a sphere is made around the neutron generator and a small bullet of uranium 235 is removed this bullet is placed at one end of a long tube as you can see with explosives behind it and the sphere or hemisphere is placed at the other end and the weapon is detonated by triggering the explosives at one end which fire the bullet into the sphere or the spike or the target and when the bullet and the sphere come together they form a super critical mass this initiates the fission reaction and there is nothing to control it so this is a runaway uncontrolled fission reaction it results in a nuclear blast now there is another kind of nuclear reaction called nuclear fusion so what is fusion so unlike fission where a nucleus is split in fusion two atoms are brought together forcibly and they are squeezed together and they form a new atom so fusion react reactions give off enormous amounts of energy in the form of heat and radiation so remember this that every time you look at the sun you are witnessing a live display of nuclear fusion now nuclear weapons that use nuclear fusion are called fusion bombs or they are also called thermonuclear bombs they are also called hydrogen bombs in some cases so these thermonuclear weapons they use an initial fission reaction to trigger a secondary nuclear fusion reaction so this thermonuclear fission fusion reaction releases hundreds of times more energy than just a fission reaction so that's a thermonuclear weapon so now nuclear weapons can either be dropped from aircraft in the form of gravity bombs or they can be delivered by missiles ballistic missiles have very long ranges and they can be launched from land and they can be launched from submarines cruise missiles on the other hand they can carry they they have shorter ranges than ballistic missiles but they are much harder to detect and to intercept now ballistic missiles can carry multiple warheads using multiple independently targetable reentry vehicle technology mirv technology this mirv technology makes it possible for each warhead in a single ballistic missile to be aimed at different targets and that brings us to an end of this very quick nuclear physics crash course